I keep my toy collection in suitcases all around my apartment, big ones, mostly this one. But over the last 20 years, I've had to put the small toys before they get crushed in cases like the ones behind me. Below that, there's an even smaller collection of things which I would like to carry in my pocket around. And over 30, 40 years of collecting, I've got them into a bunch here, which contains spare business cards I like giving people, but also some fun and game stuff. There's a lot of um, entertainment here, or funny games measured in giggles per cubic inch, perhaps, or oohs and ahs per pint. <laughs> Talking about humor or entertainment, but in a very, very small volume, and that's what these things have. So I'll show one section of this, which is playing cards, and there's a dozen of them, all of which have something quirky of them. I'll just show half a dozen for now. I've just dropped one time, let's go and retrieve it from the floor. In fact, this is how it's all started. It began with, I think it was Matti Lingolo from Finland, who showed me a card like this, which has been somehow made impossible. A bit has been cut out of it, and it's been infolded in such a way so that some of the back of the card is there, and well, the tiny back of the card is there, and then here's the front of the card and the back of the card. How has it been made? It's got a flap here. And the starting position, incidentally, is a piece of card like this, which has been cut in that way, that central bit here, comes out of the window, and then you're left, I'll take it out now, you're left with a spade that you've got to somehow manipulate into this enclosed form, so it's entrapped. This is what actually inspired this big range now, which Angus Lavery and other people have pursued over the last 20 years of impossible cards, folding cards into impossible ways. And this is really the granddaddy, the, the starting edition of it, because when I passed this on to Angus, it inspired him and then another fellow to, to start making impossible cards. So it's a lot of history in that. And I've got uh, six decks of these I picked up at the time, I had made for me at the time, so lots of fun and games there. The second one is one I've shown when I was showing the trapdoor card. It's a very easy one to make like that. And the idea is to um, get a person to hold it and to bet you can turn it upside down without them letting go. So they've got to walk into hyperspace and you've got to end up like that, but without letting go as I've just done. And you do it by infolding in a clever, well, I might as well demonstrate it. You do an action like I'm holding this all the time. I would do the side that side there, I'm going to do that side there, I'm going to do that there, and then I'm going to open it up, and it opens up the other way up. Extraordinary. So it's, uh, it's as if you've gone through hyperspace. It's made into magic tricks and lots of other versions as well. But look how easy it is to make. Just a, a playing card with creases in it and a few cuts, and it's there. Well, here's another one which a friend of mine, Mark Senator Ducati, gave me, which is a very clever one. Again, you can make that very easily yourself. This is the only one of the 12 cards I've got uh, which I find don't work satisfactorily with playing cards. It's a fairly flexible material, but it's got to be super flexible because the challenge is holding your thumb and your forefinger together. How can you turn it around so that, without letting go, but I'll let go to show you, it's going to end up like that. But how can you do that without letting go? What I discovered for this one here, for let people have a go, I cheated slightly by having it not in playing card material, though I've copied a playing card onto it, but made it this very, very flexible, untearable paper, and then you can do it very, very easily. So there you've got the nine of spades towards you, and this, uh, <clears throat> all you've got to do to make it work is push that through there, and then it all turns inside out. I'm not going to let go at any time with my forefinger. Push like that, and it's been done. Very, very nicely achieved, so a bit of topology. So that's been a good one to show people. There's another one here which is great fun. It's um, how many mistakes on this card? Well, I'll show you. There's the instructions. It shows it. How many mistakes on this card? The answer is actually surprisingly six. Can you work them out? Can you work them out? The most obvious one is there's a mismatch of from um, two here and a three hearts there. It should be either take one away or make that into a three. That's one thing. There's the obvious bit that... Um, one of these hearts should be the other way up. That's a convention. You always have one of the hearts the other way up. There's this one here, which is even more obvious because that's a two which has gone backwards. That can't have that one there. And also the heart is the wrong way up. The heart should be like that. They've made it the same way up. But in fact, when you turn it upside down, this is now the wrong way up. So there's a convention that you must have this the other way up. 
There's a rather subtle one, though, the last two of, of very well, fun. It's always been a convention to have them in these corners here, not in those corners. So for most people who are right-handed, as you make a meld of your cards to play bridge or canasta or poker, you can immediately see, looking at this corner of the card, what the value is. But here they've been put on the wrong corners. You'd probably make a left-handed deck, actually, for having them in this corner, but it's not a conventional one. The last one is a bit of um, something that a child would 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 say, and a grown ups would overlook and say, ah, "It's the wrong colour." Yes, well, it's a photocopy. No, it's the wrong colour. Yeah, it's the children were persistent. It should be done on, in in red, of course. Hearts are red, not black. So that is a little gadget to give people as a little puzzle. It's quite fun to do. And look how slim and thin it is. How easy it fits it into a wallet, etc. So that's been a great one to put into my collection of fun things. This is more elaborate, and I won't complete it, but it's one of those ones where you've got to make various cuts to the three cards. And eventually this lot with a cross over there is going to come down and work its way down until it's in the middle there like that and makes a, a burr they call it and there's a much more advanced versions of that but this was the very first one ever came out it was done actually with two bits three bits of cardboard originally but to do it in plain card is it's it's it's, it's very satisfactory i think that, that, that's going to work very nicely and then i've got one final one here to show which is kofu sato's card this is a wonderful inventive guy this is how he originally presented it in his business card. Let's see if I can get this into focus. He calls it Twisted. And you see what you've got to make, that thing down there at the bottom there, like that there. And you're given three cards with just two, those are line, the cuts, line cuts. And here are the three cards. I'll do it in a large version, make it easier. You have three cards, and each of them, all you've got to do is a sloped line cut and a cut line here. A bit tricky this, because actually to make them work well, you've got to have a bit of, of uh, air gap there to do that, so that when the cards fit in at right angles, that like that, they don't slew sideways. That fits it nicely, because that the thickness of that tiny little air gap is the thickness of the card. That's a bit tricky to do. So to put them together, it's a little bit tricky, but I'm going to have a go with three large ones of these to make it a bit easier for you to follow. This is something so, easy, so easily made from cards. So you have two cards like that, you pass it through there, and you turn it like that, and there's the first, oops, there's, it, oops, there's, it, there's the first position. So it's all nicely slotted in, and it sits there quite quite happily because those slots in it are wide enough to hold the card together. The last one is a bit trickier to do, but I've learned how to do it. I hope I have that. And the last one's got to be weaved in. It's a weaving action. This that's got to go underneath there, over there. Oh, no, it's got to go no over there. That's right. And underneath there, and slot up there. Turn it sideways. That's a penultimate position. And the last thing you do is just lift up this little flap here over there into three dimensions. And there we've got a superb intersection of three playing cards, all very happily non-distorted, but with minimal amounts of cuts. What an incredible mind he's got, Sir Kofu, to be able to, to visualize that. It's quite one of the best items of these penetrating cards I've ever come across, I think. So he sent a Christmas card every year. This last year as a Christmas card to see. I've had two changes in my life, Tim, two M's, moved house, got married. <laughs> That's nice. So I sent him a, 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 a congratulations card on both those events like that. But he's a very, very inventive person. And that's just brilliant. Kofu Sato's Twisted sits in my little wallet of fun things you can take around. <laughs>